Can I welcome each and every one of you here in St. George's Tronkirk in the heart of Glasgow and those many who are joining us online. You are all very, very welcome for this very special evening when we celebrate the incredible projects that are happening across different denominations in support of climate justice and climate action. It's been a busy day here in Glasgow with the world leaders making some important commitments and pledges about stopping deforestation and about reducing methane into the atmosphere. It's important that faith communities are part of that dialogue, offering encouragement, offering challenge, and offering prayer. But it's also important that we are seen to act as well, to do everything that we can possibly do to strive to care for God's creation. And I'm delighted that this gathering this evening will celebrate some fantastic projects that are engaged in that action. Both small scale, very local projects, but also much bigger ones. Each of them has something to teach us, some good practice to share with others so that we can multiply and scale up. And I was delighted to chair the shortlisting committee, seeing the amazing work that is already going on. And it was a tough job to sift through the dozens of applications. It was hard to pick some winners. But in the end, we did manage to choose some to particularly showcase to you this evening, offering a whole mixture of different pieces of work. And they will feature in the Church Times on Friday and on its website. And I'm immensely grateful to the Church Times for their long-standing commitment to environmental action supporting and indeed at times challenging the church to do more. And the panel had an even harder job after shortlisting to choose which ones should appear on this showreel video. And that's what's now to be premiered tonight here in Glasgow as part of COP26, the Global Climate Summit. Enjoy all that you're about to watch and see, and be inspired. Climate change. It's easy to despair of the task ahead of us, but it is possible, with time, effort and dedication, to help prepare God's earth. The many churches and Christian bodies have been active in this for many years, cutting their carbon footprint and protecting the environment. Working together, the Church of England's Environment Programme and the Church Times set out this year to showcase some of these projects. We heard from more than 150 groups and churches, any of which we could have chosen to show here. The seven examples we picked showcase the huge variety of approaches. We hope that they'll encourage and inspire others to join the fight against this climate crisis. This area was full of wildlife. It, it was just so full of life and, well, just look at it now. We've been fighting development of this area for the last three years and unfortunately we lost the appeal in March this year. This was full of birds. I mean, where have they, where, where have they gone? Where are they supposed to go? We can't just keep constricting them into smaller and smaller areas. Well, it's devastating. It's, it's all been demolished. There's a, as you can see from the enormous pile of trees in the background, the community is really upset um, and we can't bear to walk past it, to be quite frank. If we don't act now, we will lose species, we'll lose habitat, we'll also lose all the benefits that the nature provides to humans as well. And that's everything from climate regulation, flood regulation, 
and health and well-being benefits. It really is time to prevent that crisis by acting together to take action for nature. And that's what we want to help people do through Nature Recovery Sheffield. We'd been petitioning the council, we'd all joined together, lots of groups, organisations. We said, why don't we declare a nature emergency for Sheffield ourselves? More than 1,000 individuals signed up to declare a nature emergency with us and more than 30 organisations. So now it's about working together to see if we can set in motion a nature recovery plan for Sheffield. The first thing is to acknowledge that there's a really serious emergency and a crisis in nature uh, all over the world. We're focusing on Sheffield. We'd like to see throughout the, the city, throughout the countryside surrounding it, a real awareness of the crisis for biodiversity, the loss of habitats. By acknowledging that and declaring a nature emergency, we really wanted people to come together and then think about actions that we could take lobbying uh, politicians and the council and working together for a nature recovery plan for Sheffield. We need to be prophetic, courageous and get out there and state our case. We have so much in common with groups who are working um, in the environmental area. The church needs to be involved alongside people of faith and people of no faith. We believe as Christians that it's part of our calling to care for God's creation and that means taking action. It means repenting and lamenting what we've done to God's beautiful earth, and it means working all together to try to take action to care for creation. As an eco-church, we're very focused on being stewards of the environment and to work with Vision 21 was a really good opportunity for us. There's a real need for things like this. People like to hold on to some of their possessions. They have great sentimental value and if they can get them repaired at a very modest cost, then they'd rather do that than have them thrown away, sent to landfill where they're gonna go into a tip maybe even pollute the area. I brought a steam mop in today that wasn't functioning properly and I thought, well, let the experts have a go at it better than me. I brought a, a printer in, been intermittently working and not working and finally packed up a few months ago. I've brought two garden tools, garden shears and secateurs because they're very rusty and they need sharpened. It's really important for everybody is this. Recycling and reuse helps save the planet. I think it's important we recognise that we have to work together to fit in the community. It's not something we can do as churches by ourselves, but by working with our partners in the community, we can make a, a real difference for God's world. It's a very important part of our outreach because it helps us to bring in the community. It's really easy to set a, a repair cafe up, but you do have to know a little bit of background beforehand. Public liability insurance is important to have. It's all part of our charitable works. There is a cost to it. We have to have the insurance. We have to buy some tools and things like that. Repairs are done for free. Obviously, we, we would like a donation off, off people, and if it, certainly if you have to pay for any parts that we, we get. I mean, we will do it for nothing. If people haven't got anything to give us, they'll get the repair for free. But we, we do like a little bit off them. I think for us, the main challenge was that we didn't have the resources and experience to set up the cafe. So I'd recommend, you know, working with a partner. I think being able to establish a network is a really important. We tend to rely much more on the, the word of mouth. And I think, in all honesty, that's probably we found to be the most effective way from us. We have a great partnership with the church. They've got the venue, we've got the skills, and the public just come to us. Our church was an eco-congregation since 2008. 
and we set out various groups to outwork what we were going to do to be an eco-congregation. And as a result of those, we eventually decided to set up a team which was in charge of building a new structure next to our 1890s church, which really would encapsulate our view of the future and living lightly on God's earth so that we could not just talk about climate change, but do something about it. We had to demolish the old building down to the mud, which left a rather deep hole on the edge of a hill. And then we had to rebuild in that this two-story building. And then we found excellent builders. And when we tested it at the end, it was one of the most airtight buildings ever seen by the airtight inspectors. So we were delighted. The heating of the building is by electricity and all the air used is expelled and replaced with fresh air preheated in the heat exchanger. On top of that, when it's very cold, we occasionally do have to have these far infrared heaters on in the ceilings, but they're tiny things. We wish to express our faith in the building and we're carrying out Christ's great commission in Mark 16, 15, proclaim the good news to the whole creation. It is essential before you do any of this to think 10 years ahead and to plan to raise the consciousness of people to uh, save biodiversity and worship God's whole creation. So get minds and souls and spirits ready before you lay bricks. In Blackburn Diocese, we have 190 Church of England schools, the vast majority of which are voluntary aided schools, which meant that when Synod made their declaration to, to get to zero carbon by 2030, it was particularly interesting for us as that included voluntary aided schools. We therefore bid for government funding through the public sector decarbonisation scheme and were fortunate enough to be awarded eight and a half million pounds to begin to answer those questions. How do you retrofit decarbonize old school buildings, rural school buildings, high school buildings, urban school buildings? And we have over the last few months worked with specialists to determine exactly how we do that. One of the schools we work with is Chorley St. Lawrence, which wasn't performing particularly well in terms of its energy usage. So we thought, if we can work out how to decarbonise that building, it will give us an idea how we can perhaps decarbonise some other of, uh, of our school buildings. We did a review of all the possible options uh, to, to best suit the school and, and, and provide the best decarbonisation results. And we ended up with ground source heat pumps feeding to the existing boiler room and then through to improvements with the existing heating system throughout school. So what we'll end up with here is about 4,500 linear metres of pipe work and then seven boreholes to produce the output that we need. Chorley St Lawrence was a particularly challenging school because it was oil powered, uh, it didn't have particularly good insulation, uh, the windows were not in a particularly good state, so we needed to address the fabric of the building to make sure that that then could take a heat decarbonised source. We've also replaced all the lighting in school to LED lighting to reduce the electrical load. And we've also introduced solar panels on the roof, again, to provide direct energy, not to have to take it from the grid. In, in total, we've had about 25 schools involved in this scheme. And we've ranged from putting air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, solar panels, added insulation into those buildings. And we're at a point now of working out just what we've learned from that experience. Across our scheme, we have found out that actually the technology is there, but generally it's expensive. In almost all cases, it's disruptive, but it's a journey that we're committed to taking. If you need to take that journey, the one thing I would highly recommend is to work out what that first step is. For us, that meant we needed a heat decarbonisation plan for all our schools, which are now something that we have got and we can work out exactly how we do that across the whole of our estate.
We know the earth is the Lord's. He made it and it is good. We know creation is in trouble because of the actions of humans. We know we're commanded to love our neighbours, but we also know our neighbours around the world are suffering the effects of the damage we have done to the earth. We know as Christians we must do something, but maybe we don't always know what. The Creation Care Scheme is designed to help households systematically look at seven areas of their life to see where they're doing well and give ideas to how they can better care for God's creation. These areas are worship and prayer, home, garden, travel, food, possessions, and community and global engagement. It's designed to help households work out what their next steps are in caring for God's creation, It's also designed to help us celebrate our successes with bronze, silver, and gold awards. Sign up today to work out what your next steps are in caring for God's wonderful creation. I think the first thing I would recommend is to spend time understanding why it is that we're wanting to do this. So how it is that caring for creation is a part of showing our love for God and our love for our neighbours. Another thing which has been really helpful is to connect with others with a similar heart, both within your church and beyond it. We've really benefited at St Paul's from working with other local churches and the Guildford Diocese Environment Group uh, on activities. So we've held an eco-fair in the town. We've met with our MP with, with the other local churches. So it's really encouraging and you can learn from each other and inspire each other. For us, it's just been about keeping taking the next step. And God has helped us at each stage. My final tip would be just to spend time in nature connecting with God uh, to renew your strength. He will lift you up on eagle's wings. In 2015, Pope Francis wrote his encyclica, Laudato Si. So Laudato Si means praise be to you. We are invited to listen to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. In 2019, Bishop John invited us all across the diocese to take action to care for our common home and for each other. He also, at his home at Wardley Hall, started the Laudato Sea Centre. We are working to empower local communities to care for our common home, from school children to the Prince's Trust that came and developed our own herb garden the phase one of the project is creating the space in the wall garden for people to use. We worked with a cluster of head teachers from the local community and we came up with an idea of having an eco summit. Each school would send a delegate from years one to six and they would bring a eco activity to the day and they would carousel around it and share in all the other schools eco activities and towards the end of the day they then came together to write in their own small school clusters sort of environmental pledges that they took back to their school and this became the springboard for the work that they they were going to carry on doing within their own school community. The place was crawling with young people, it was absolutely fantastic. It was wonderful to hear them laughing, to see them running around the garden and then at the end they were sat under the willow tunnel listening to a story based on nature. After the children left and we walked around the garden, it was so wonderful to see bird feeders that they made, full of seeds hanging from the trees that we planted, and stones that they'd placed with their own dreams and stories scattered around the garden. They'd really made an impression. They'd even drawn on the greenhouse where there was lots of stories and animals to be seen. We couldn't have started this project without the local community. We listened to what they wanted, we spoke to our school children, we visited school grounds. We've also been really fortunate to create partnerships with other organisations who have donated some time and materials to help develop the project. The truth is that change is coming, whether we like it or not. This world is shifting, and climate emergency is moving that forward quite quickly. The Diocese of Bristol, one of the places that we're located, declared a climate emergency. We're going to need communities of resilience that can handle the change that's coming. We do um, 
church in a community garden. We give away about 95% of what we grow. Well, it's wonderful to have a church like Hazelnut in the diocese. Um, they're doing fantastic work, bringing the community together to grow, veg, and worship outdoors in creation. And the focus of every service and meeting together is on God's presence in all of creation and how we as Christians can work together to protect God's earth. There's three million new gardeners in the last year. So people are, are finding through COVID that there is a beauty and life in the outdoors that they've never encountered before. The garden works across loads of different cultures and where church can sometimes be a tricky space or a place where you have to find out their culture and their rhythms. A garden you can get into quite quickly. We don't see ourselves in competition with the church. We see ourselves sitting right alongside of it. So we think this is a reasonable act within unreasonable times. Starting in January is Potting Shed. And Potting Shed is for anybody, a church, an individual, a community that wants to start something. It's a five month course, but it's also a place to build community, to think theologically, to come up with practical things like a garden plan. And the idea is that you can come out and it'll help you jumpstart that project. It's totally free and it's all on Zoom, so you can do it anywhere. I'd say to any church or group, give it a go, because a lot of churches have some land, even city centre churches have some space around them, because it's very visible. People don't have to come into the church building, you can meet outdoors, it's a safe, inclusive space, and it's a great opportunity for churches. Totally free. Wasn't that amazing and inspiring, seeing such a range of different projects, pieces of work, caring for God's creation. My sort of takeaways from it are that it's all about being local, about being passionate, about being committed, and being God-focused. So many of those projects are about local people coming together, passionate about the sense of space and the sense of place in which they live. They come with a real passion to achieve something and to be involved, gathering other people around them, kind of infectious passion to care. They come with huge commitment and I imagine many of those projects had many ups and downs as they went along, many joyous happy moments, but also, I imagine, some tear-filled, anxious times, and when people felt, gosh, is this really worth doing? And yet they kept on. And God-focused, both in terms of loving God and loving our neighbor. Loving God in the care of this gift of God's creation that is shared with all of us and loving our neighbors, our neighbors very locally, but our neighbors also globally. I was so struck today by speaking to various indigenous people about the wisdom they carry, about their commitment to the land, how they are guardians and great stewards. In the Blue Zone this morning, we were discussing the protection of forests and forest environments around the world, seeking commitments from global leaders to stop deforestation, stop the degradation of forests, and start to restore them and see them rejuvenated more. And I was struck actually by the President of the United States, Joe Biden, who ended his words really sharply by saying, summon the will, we can do this, it will have a generational impact. Let's pray that the leaders of the world have as much passion and commitment and stability as we've seen these projects demonstrate. And this local and international, global 
that we're holding together during these two weeks is really important because we can each do our part, play our part, commit our part, whether in our families, our schools, or our influence in the nation, or encouraging those who can influence the nations of the world, using our voice too in protest, in lament, and encouragement to bring about influence. And somebody who has done so much to enable the church to think theologically about creation care, who has been passionate in the way she lives out her life, in how she is so utterly committed to the care of creation, is my friend Ruth Valeria. Ruth, it's a huge privilege to have you here tonight. I know you're doing all sorts of things during COP, but thank you for coming and sharing some of your collected wisdom from these days. Ruth is the Director of Advocacy and Influencing at Tear Funds, and Ruth, you are most welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Bishop Graham. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, thank you for the, those of you who are here in person and to those of you watching online as well, you're really welcome. And it's such an honor and a privilege to be here and to sit and watch that video. Do you know, you come to COP to these talks really full of hope but also full of a little bit of realism and not quite sure as to quite where we're going to get to at the end. But watching the video and seeing the different projects, um, and as Graham was saying, just that passion and the commitment and the tenacity fills me with hope. I am so often asked, in fact, I can probably guarantee everywhere I go, the question I will be asked is, do I have any hope? And watching that video is one of the things that I can answer that does give me hope. And I do see hope in the different projects that we see here around the United Kingdom, in the different projects that I'm involved with supporting around the world, seeing Christians and people of other faiths rising up, engaging, getting to grips with the climate crisis that we're facing fills me with hope. So I am absolutely delighted in the midst of the other things that I'm going to be doing that I could take this hour to be at something so positive and so hope-filled. I'm here with my team from Tear Fund and we're around doing a variety of things. Some of us are in the blue zones, some of us are outside doing speaking engagements and supporting the church and the different campaign things that are happening. And one of my privileges is that as a team, we have been able to bring over just a few people from outside of the UK to be with us and to speak with us and to, to share these couple of weeks with us. And I just want to tell you about them. One person is called Hockerbed, and she is an indigenous theologian from the Guna people in Panama. And Graham was already mentioning around people from indigenous communities and just the richness of what we can be learning from them and from the, the, the inherent connection that so often people from indigenous communities have with the wider natural world. We have also brought over a woman called Cookie from India and a man called Promise from Nigeria. Why have we brought them here? Because all of them in different ways are experiencing firsthand the impacts of the climate crisis. Hockerbed is from Panama and she is seeing the, her islands, the island that her, her community inhabits, she is seeing her islands coming under threat 
as the seas rise around her. Cookie from India is experiencing firsthand and with the communities that she is involved with, serv with serving, is experiencing the droughts that they have there and then also flooding. I have a, another colleague who is Indian and has been able to get back recently and see her family and has been traveling around India and showing me the pictures of the awful flooding that is being experiencing, that is being experienced, and then the devastating loss of crops that are happening. And people are literally starving. We are seeing world hunger increase, having made such positive steps. In 2016, we saw world hunger increase for the first time, and now year on year since 2016, it is getting worse and worse. And Promise is here from Nigeria, from the Joss Plateau State, and he is a, a wonderful man engaged with something called the Joss Green Center, a young climate activist. And in his area, he and his community experience climate change. They also experience both flooding and drought. And the drought that they are seeing then increases the ethnic tensions and leads to terrible conflicts that some of us may well be aware of that's being experienced in northern Nigeria. It's such a, a joy to have them with us. And we wanted to bring them over because, of course, it is so important that we are hearing from people who are right at the, at the front, who are bearing the impact of the climate crisis. At Tear Fund, we hear every day the devastating impact that the climate crisis is having on people living in poverty. As we uh, have seen climate increasing in our agendas over recent decades, it has changed from being something that is a prediction. I know decades ago when I was talking on these issues, it was a prediction. If we don't do this now, this will happen in decades to come. And it's been a, an awful thing for me to realize that we have flipped over from prediction into reality. This isn't about something in the future, as important as the future is. This is a recognition that we are in a climate emergency now. And it's an issue of justice. 3.5 billion people, the economically poorest 3.5 billion people in our world only cause 10% of global emissions, and yet they are the ones who are suffering the consequences. And we're here at COP26 to push our world governments to be keeping within the safer limit of 1.5 degrees. Why? Because there is a huge difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees. That difference is around droughts lasting twice as long if we reach 2 degrees. It's about 116 million more people struggling to get water. It's about four times as many cyclones hitting countries. And if we were to reach two degrees, we would see 12 million more people flooded in coastal areas. So we're here to stand together in solidarity with people in poverty all around the world. And why does that matter for us as Christians? There's a passage that I just keep coming back to again and again and again over recent months. And it's Psalm 113, which is a wonderful psalm of praise to God. Praise the Lord, you servants. Praise the name of the Lord. The Lord's name is to be praised both now and forevermore. He's exalted over the nations. His glory is, a, is above the heavens. And it goes on and goes on. This almighty, majestic, amazing God that the psalmist is just pouring uh, his, presumably, praises out to God. But there's one characteristic that the psalmist focuses on around this amazing God who is glorious. And that characteristic is that he raises the poor from the dust 
and lift the needy from the ash heap. What an amazing characteristic to pull out about our God. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. And our little actions, and we've seen some big actions as well today, are all part of us responding to our worship of this God who raises the poor from the dust, lifts the needy from the ash heap, and who calls us to do the same. We are called to spend ourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. And our little and our big actions will contribute towards us being able to do that. So let's celebrate this evening. This evening is an evening of hope. It's an evening of goodness. It's an evening where we see real practical demonstration of how we are worshipping this God who raises the poor from the dust. Every action that we do counts. So thank you very much. Thank you on behalf of so many people. And I hope what we've seen this evening will inspire you in your churches to be doing likewise. Ruth, thank you very much. And with that call to hope, to goodness, and to action, we're going to move on to hear now from Richard Black, the Senior Associate at the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit, who has been in the Blue Zone today with some reflections. He's also a former BBC environment correspondent. Now, there is going to be an opportunity after Richard has spoken to ask any questions, either uh, from here in, in St. George's Tron Kirk or via the YouTube. And uh, please add your questions, and they will be read out here. Even if you're in the room, you can still do it on YouTube if you wanted to. Uh, but we'll have, hopefully, uh, a good number of questions after Richard has spoken. Richard, you're most welcome. Well, thanks, thanks very much, Graham. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. So, um, as, as, as Graham said, I'm Senior Associate with the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit, which is a very long name for a very small organization. But um, we have, uh, I, I, I was director until the end of last year, and we've had um, wonderful uh, representatives from the Church of England working with us uh, during the seven years journey, right Reverend Richard Charters, the former Bishop of London, who some of you uh, may remember, and more recently Bishop Nick, who's been the, the previously the Church's lead bishop for the environment. So it's been a pleasure. Um, so um, I, basically, I was thinking about um, the kind of year, two years that we've had, very, very strange two years. Um, and one of the things that's really impressed me during that time is the elderly. So my mother's now in her 80s, and she has a lot of friends who are in their 80s. And they've coped overall with COVID, lockdown, and so on. I think a lot better than people of uh, younger generations. And I've, 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 I often ask why, and I think one thing about um, certainly my mum and her group of friends is that they don't overthink, they do. So if you're feeling down, you get busy. And I know it's not a philosophy that works for everyone, but I, I, it, it, seem, it does seem for, for her and her friendship group to, to have kept them really, really sort of sane and, and, and on the level. And um, in the, I think this has relevance to climate change because um, over the years, um, a lot of environment organizations and scientists and so on have tried to connect people with the climate crisis by talking about the impacts. Um, now, we need to know about the impacts. It's absolutely true. But if it, it can lead either to a feeling of, right, I'm going to do something about this, or it can lead to a kind of fatalism and there's nothing I can do and a kind of paralysis. And I, I was talking to a friend of mine today who, who told me that, you know, that there is going to be an opinion survey uh, coming out quite soon, maybe even this week, um, looking at youngsters worldwide. And a, a large proportion of them are feeling fatalistic now about the climate crisis. They're really feeling that there's nothing they can do. I've argued for a long time that actually if you want to connect people with this issue, rather than focusing on the problem, focus on the solution. Because when you, when, you, when you do something, you can engage with it. And you are contributing to the solution in however small or however big a way. And as we saw 
from all those examples, this is exactly what, what these groups of people have decided to do. And as well as doing something that works concretely for climate change or biodiversity, um, it, it makes them feel good as well. You can see the empowerment and the agency coming through in, in those little films. It's not something, of course, that we is unique to the UK. One of my favorite ever stories about um, nature protection. Um, I, I used to work years and years and years ago for the BBC World Service, and I used to work with the, the Far Eastern Service. And at one point, there was a group of Thai monks, Thai Buddhist monks, who wanted to um, tackle deforestation in, in Eastern Thailand. They ordained, uh, ordained about 60 million trees, because that meant those trees couldn't be cut down. Fantastic idea. So that is leadership in action by people just doing something that works in that particular context. You'll probably have heard of Wangari Maathai, the, the, the Kenyan activist who, who led, really single-handed, created this movement for reforestation in, in Eastern Africa. So leadership, getting on with things, doing something. It's a, it makes you feel good and it achieves something as well. And down at COP26 today, we've had a welter of announcements coming from governments and groups groups of governments. And again, some of them are better than others. Some of them are, you know, a bit flim flam, but others uh, have, have got some meaningful content as well. But again, what that tells you is that it always needs one or two to lead, to start something. So one of the announcements that we will be having later in, and I can talk about it because it is already in the public domain, some of you probably heard of it, you know, it's very clear now, if we're, if we're going to get out of the climate crisis, we basically need to stop producing fossil fuels. The consumption of fossil fuels is probably where we need to put most of the effort, but actually the production is a, is a real thing as well. So we're going to see later, you know, the, the, later in the meeting, Denmark and Costa Rica trying to launch a global alliance of countries who are basically saying, right, we're not going to explore for fossil fuels anymore, and we're going to set an end date for when we're going to extract them. That's the kind of leadership from nations that really makes a difference. And there are so many examples of this. Germany, 20 years ago, invested massively in solar panels. Actually, a lot of that was, was from communities in the countryside who wanted to have more, more ownership over their energy production. That investment by German government and German farmers and German industry created a, a, a huge industry in making solar panels that then got taken up by Chinese and Indian factories who could do it much cheaper, and as a result, that we now have much cheaper solar power. That was leadership by, by that group, by, by, by that one country. You can think of the UK um, setting a, the Climate Change Act in 2008. There are lots of things that are very imperfect about the UK's record, but that Climate Change Act has now been copied and replicated in a number of other countries, Denmark, New Zealand, Ireland even. So, you know, you, you do that leadership thing and other people uh, will, will learn from it and, and will take something. And this is one of the things that I really have enjoyed whenever I've come uh, to speak at events like this connected with, with the church, because churches are visible within a community. And in, in some cases, literally visible, as we saw from the example of the community gardens. But it, churches can lead in the community and not take no for an answer and just do stuff and be a model that other people can then take. And in the process, of course, every time a church installs something like a ground source heat pump, the price of that will come down a little bit because the more of these things are made, the more competition there is in the market, the quicker the prices will come down and that will benefit, benefit everyone. Um, so leadership, an example, and I, I just I just want to end with a sort of slight 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 rant about the um, the opponents of climate change, who will accuse people like you, probably most of you, of being doom mongers. They're the doom mongers because their whole philosophy is it it won't work. You can't do it. There's no point. No one else is going to bother. Um, you probably saw the story that was created a, a, about a week ago by this. A uh, fairly pathetic PR person who uh, said he did an opinion poll which claimed to show that British people want a referendum on, the, on net zero with the implication that British people don't want the UK to, to, to achieve its net zero target. It's the most dismal kind of way of looking at things, of engaging with things. Let, let, let's just slow, let's just slow down. Let's just have a, let's just have a think again. M maybe people won't go for this. 
Um, and the, 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 the whole, what underpins it is this idea, it won't work, we can't do it. And, and I really want to celebrate every example, whether it's a country, a business, community group, an individual, that just doesn't have any truck with that and says, no, I'm gonna do this. And so I really thank you for the invitation tonight because it's been inspiring, thank you. Richard, thank you so much and, and for that affirmation of this evening and what we're trying to do in this celebration of the commitment of so many different people. There's now an opportunity to ask questions uh, of Ruth and, and of Richard. Well, we're going to stand at the mic so that we're in view of, of the, the camera. Uh, we've got various questions. So we've got uh, Vanya there and uh, can we come over of you. YouTube, that's, oh, I'll bring the mic over so you can speak into it. Um, and we've only got a short amount of time, so keep your question to a question, that'd be brilliant. But I'll start with the one on YouTube while I'm walking around the room. Yeah, fantastic. It's very simple, but also complicated. What are the best trees for me to plant in my garden? Oh, well, can I answer that as a sort of Definitely. person who does quite a bit in forestry? I would uh, strongly suggest a really good British native, um, or, or wherever you are in the world, plant a native species and, uh, and, 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 and choose a tree that is going to be appropriate for the size of your garden. Because then you'll, uh, by choosing a British native, you will also um, then attract the, the natural biodiversity for that species. I would also try to go for us, uh, the provenance of the tree towards the south of England because of the warming climate. Um, those trees will survive potentially uh, better. But we've got to be really careful at the moment because you know, the, the tree diseases that are coming into the UK, there's, there's, there's in a sense been about one a year different tree disease, ash calara or processionary oak moth or another one. Um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago that's, that's entered. So, you know, um, choose something that you also enjoy and delight in because there's nothing better than sitting under a tree that you have planted. Anything else? Uh, I was just going to say preferably one that produces something you can eat as well is always good from my perspective. And Richard, <laughs> yeah, I have no, nothing much to add except that and a couple of years ago the Royal Horticultural Society produced a kind of guide to gardening in climate change. I'm, I'm not a gardener, so, but it might be worth having a look at that. Great, and, and Father, if you could just add... Uh, yeah, Brother Alistair are. from uh, Christian Climate Action. I'd like to ask about the 70 million pounds down the back of the wrong sofa, um, and when the Church of England will actually be divesting properly from, in, uh, from fossil fuels. Uh, thank you. I'm a British journalist based in Malta and also a secular Franciscan in the Anglican Church. My question is for Bishop Graham. Uh, the Pope launched Laudato Si six years ago, and Sunday the 14th he's going to launch the seven-year Laudato Si platform. So far the document's about that. It's all about Catholics doing this, that, and the other. So how can the other churches, in fact, uh, join this? And did you get a chance to talk about this kind of thing with Cardinal Paroline? Um, you can chip in as well your views on, on these things. But uh, I haven't met uh, Cardinal Perini yet. Uh, I'd be very glad to. Um, but I was at um, the Vatican three weeks ago for the launch of the appeal uh, that Pope Francis gathered together the leaders of the world's religions to um, launch an appeal for um, COP26, which was given to Alok Sharma, which was an incredible event because in that room that morning, there were probably about 80% of the world's population represented. And there's a beautiful line in that appeal that we, we inherited a garden. We must not pass it on as a desert. And the question about uh, divestment is, is a very pressing one at the moment. Uh, my own Darson Synod will be voting on Saturday about uh, divestment uh, for the Diocese of Norwich, and I will be voting for that. 
we have very small uh, currently uh, investments in, in oil and gas, and I'll be voting to divest. Nationally, the, the General Synod of the Church of England took the decision to engage until 2023. So until 2023, the, um, the Church of England Pension Board and the Church Commissioners are actively engaging with uh, oil and gas companies to bring them to be aligned with the Paris Agreement. They've set up an incredible piece of work called the Transition Pathway Initiative, which has about 30 trillion in assets from a whole range of different partners to bring about change. Uh, and there was some success already. This is a really tricky one though, because divest and who sucks up the shares? It'll be hedge fund managers that will suck up the shares of the Diocese of Norwich, our small number. Uh, and they will you know, probably press for more extraction, more uh, exploration. And, and then there's the engagement article, you know, item. And in a sense, we're both trying, both approaches are trying to bring about change and difference. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's a complex area, as I know you are aware. But uh, Ruth, you might have some reflections on this as well. Yeah, happy to. So I know this is a really emotive topic that we rightly feel very passionate about. Um, on, a, on a personal level, I've, I am divested for what it's worth. Um, when I came of age, I came into a, a modest inheritance. I don't want that to sound grander than it is. I came into a modest inheritance and saw my stockbroker to, who wanted to explain it to me in the first one over the first thing I said to him, and this is a few decades ago, I won't tell you quite how many. Uh, one of the first things I said to him was, I don't want it in any extractive. Um, he said, well, you do know that it'll, it'll impact the, your holdings. Um, and I said, yes, I said, that's fine. Well, I don't want to be earning money in, in a way that has harmed other people and harmed the, the wider earth. So I was very happy for, to take that decision. So personally, I'm divested. I do also recognize that it's, it's an, this is a nuanced debate. So in general, I'm in favor of divestment, but I also can see where engagement has its place. I think the reality hit me similarly to what Bishop Graham was saying around hedge funds when I was talking with a, a good friend of mine who is head of legal at one of the UK's largest oil trading companies. It's a company that uh, is entirely, it's a huge company, but it's entirely off the radar. It's privately owned by one person. It has no shareholders, so it has no accountability. And, and I was talking to my friend about it and asking if he was busy and what they were doing and so on. And he said, yeah, we're really busy. Uh, and, and I'm really busy in what I'm doing because we're buying up everything that the big, the, the others are selling off. They're selling, they're wanting to get rid of their dirty assets and they're selling them off cheaply, so we're buying them all up. And it was a real kind of slap in the face <laughs> for me as I realized that the companies that are accountable in one way, as they get rid of their dirty assets, actually it doesn't stop the activity, it just shifts them into an area that is unaccountable. So that was a, a, a salient thing for me to realize as I'm thinking through the divestment engagement approach. And I, so I do recognize that engagement plays a part. Yeah, I, I, I would echo that. It, it is a complex subject. I think divestment has definitely played a massive role in sort of increasing awareness of the, uh, of the issue. But apart from that, there, there, there is the absolute the, 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 the risk that um, Ruth mentioned there and actually we see it also on the level of oil companies and oil, oil fields themselves have been uh, recently for example um, I think Bloomberg did a big article about this about six months ago where they were looking at um, where a big oil company um, sold its wells in Alaska uh, partly because of shareholder pressure and what happened was that got taken over by a private operator who then is not subject to the same kind of environmental standards as, as, as the big one. Now, you can argue the rights and wrongs of this, and I, I don't have a one-size-fits-all answer, to be honest. What I do think is that the recent 
International Energy Agency report has changed the game uh, in terms of what's acceptable from an oil company and or any other company and actually and what's acceptable from a nation as well because what it says very clearly is that if, if we're going to keep the global warming to 1.5 Celsius, we have enough fossil fuels in the pipeline already. So one of the things that I'm involved with with ECIU is uh, a group that's looking at all the net zero targets that have been set by uh, countries, states and regions, cities and uh, companies. Um, we now have 4,000 uh, entities that we've examined. You can find it on, on the web. We've got a shiny new website. Uh, the, the URL is www dot zero tracker dot net and we're looking at the integrity of those targets as, mu as much as actually what the company has said and one of the things that I so we look at things like ha have they got an interim target um, if it's a business does it cover all of their emissions or just some um, if it's a, a country does it cover all greenhouse gases or just carbon dioxide so basically trying to unpick what it means to have a a net zero target because they do run they do run from the very authentic through to the absolute uh, greenwash and one of the things that I want to add into things that we collect or into the data we collect is have you set an end date basically for getting out of fossil fuels or maybe we'll phrase it um, have you said that you will not in engage in further fossil fuel development because if you haven't then you're not compatible with global net zero whatever that you say about your own targets so I think you know from an oil company to say basically you shouldn't be doing any we're now at a stage where if they're serious about um you know uh, about getting to net zero they shouldn't be engaging in any more exploration and development because the iea said we we don't need it we shouldn't have it so i'm really sorry giles um a really very quick one because we've got to finish at six back to churches there's yeah. more questions on the internet Right. And more people. Yes. Bring it back to churches. Sorry? Oh, okay. I want to ask Ruth about the idea of Yeah. Thank you. So asking how can churches that are really engaged locally make the connection with the global issues? And that's one of the, one of the areas of the eco-church scheme is around local and global engagement. So if, you're, if your church is linked up with eco-church, then that should be a natural part of, of what you're doing there. But then, of course, there's all sorts of other ways. So um, if your Church of England, which uh, this is the main point of this evening, then you will have a linked diocese um, in another part of the world. And it would be great to be drawing on that and hearing from them and really building a good relationship with them in both ways so that you learn from each other and you're able to support them with the challenges that they're facing. Of course, peer funds and Christian Aid and CAFOD and other organizations are great places to go to. We uh, run a churches scheme at Tier Fund and would really encourage people to have a look at the website and to see how you and your church can link up with the work that we're doing, working in around 50 countries, some of the poorest communities. So there are good organizations out there that can help you with that as well. So, thanks. Ruth, thank you very much and thank you uh, to all of you who've asked questions this evening, I'm very sorry that we've not been able to take them all. But the Glasgow Declaration, the Interfaith Declaration, uh, certainly lays out the hopes for faith communities in this city and beyond for the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, but please join in praying for a good outcome from the Global Climate Summit. My thanks particularly to Tear Fund and to St. George's Tron for hosting this live event. To our speakers, Ruth Valerio and Richard Black, thank you so much for being with us. And the show reel producer, Gordon Lamont, for such a, a stunningly beautiful film. Thank you to everyone who's been watching at home, as well as all of you present here in Glasgow. Let's hope and pray that the momentum 
that has been built may come truly to fruition. And let's pray to end. A prayer written by Dave Fuchless from Arosha for this fortnight. Creator God, giver of life, you sustain the earth and direct the nations. In this time of climate crisis, grant us clarity to hear the groaning of creation and the cries of the poor. Challenge us to change our lifestyles. Guide our leaders to take courageous action. Enable your church to be a beacon of hope and foster within us a renewed vision for your purposes for your world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by and for whom all things were made. Amen. So, good night from Glasgow and from COP26. Thank you.